Hey y'all, welcome to our brief lecture, a little overview of 19th century nationalism. So we are now in unit two, thinking about the creation of nations and looking at how these nations start interacting with themselves and with others around the world. So today we're just going to overview a little bit about the creation of the concept of nations and nation states, a little bit about the concept of nationalism, and we're going to see how that played out throughout Europe and also around the world, specifically in the Americas, um, also in the 19th century. So let's begin. All right, so to start off, we want to get familiar with a couple basic terms. And these are probably mostly terms that you've already heard before in varying contexts, these. Um, but I want to make sure that we're starting from the same place with our understanding. So our first term is a concept of state. And the other thing to note is that a lot of these um, words are often used interchangeably and that's totally okay. But for our intents and purposes, a state is a political territory organized under one government. Um, so what that means is it's usually like a region, an area that has defined borders and has some specific government. It also has this feeling of um, sovereignty, which is just the rule of oneself. So what that means is that whatever happens in the border of that country, of that state, is under control of that specific government. And a government that's outside of that state would not have any say. So, you know, we experience that now, you know, here in the United States, we make our own government and Canada, despite their best interests, they cannot come in and they cannot tell us what to do, even though they're constantly wanting to, those wily Canadians. All right, our next concept is nation. And a nation is a body of people united by shared common ethnicity, culture, history, language, etc. So if you remember last year learning about in ethnic studies when we talked a lot about our identities. A nation is often a group of people um, of a large regional um, country-esque size of people that are um, united by some of their shared common identities. So most um, typically this is ethnicity or language or shared culture. Um, typically nations are of large country-esque sizes. Um, and really nations became a um, modern concept in the 19th century. Prior to the 19th century, we largely had states that were ruled by kings and queens, thinking about the Ansan regime, thinking about um, divine right, and people didn't really question why they were part of a particular country or state. But in the 19th century, this concept of nationhood really began and people started thinking about, well, why am I in this state as opposed to a different state? Um, and that also really married the ideas of nationhood and statehood under the concept of nation state. And that's generally what our countries that we're familiar with now that we live in, we live in nation states. And these are political states whose citizens share common traits and are generally homogenous. Um, you know, the United States is a little bit of an outlier in that we're very heterogeneous, meaning that we have a lot of diverse peoples. But if you think about countries um, in um, England, England, in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, Middle East, Latin America, etc. Um, typically, they're dominated by one culture, that um, hegemony of that dominant culture, um, and they share a lot of those common values that you see in nations. They share common ethnicity, they share common history, common language, culture, etc. Um, so that's really what a nation state is. It's really a modern type of government. And it really started developing in mass in the 19th century, following those revolutions that we saw in the Atlantic from our previous unit. And then finally, our last main term that we want to be familiar with is the concept of nationalism. And nationalism is pride in one's culture, pride in one's shared values, pride in one's nation state. So it can be tied to a political entity, but it can also be beyond that. We can have transnational pride. Um, and we see that all the time. You know, there's people that have patriotic pride in one's government. So, you know, like people that are super excited about the United States, but then there's also national pride in shared ethnicity, shared culture. So people that are like really excited about their Irish American heritage or Irish American nationalism or nationalism for another country. 
So those are four terms that um, I wanted to make sure that we were all confident with because as we move forward and look at how they play out historically, we want to kind of make sure that we're on the same page. Okay, so when we left off thinking back in time, we really got through those revolutions and we really saw how they really changed the landscape of the Americas as well as impacted what was going on in Europe. Now, after the French Revolution, remember we have our reign of terror, Robespierre, you know, the streets are running red with blood, the guillotine is just going nonstop. And out of that chaos and insanity comes Napoleon. And Napoleon is gonna crown himself emperor. He's gonna be really excited about it, but it's not gonna be enough for him. And instead he's going to wanna to go beyond France and he starts a series of wars in the first two decades of the 19th century. These are called the Napoleonic Wars because they're named after Napoleon. Good job, Napoleon. You got a war named after you. Um, ultimately, spoiler alert, Napoleon is unsuccessful. It takes two tries though. Um, you know takes a while. It's when we learn to never invade Russia in the winter because it's never going to work out for you. Um, you'd be surprised at how many people still have not learned that lesson. Um, and ultimately, Napoleon is defeated in 1815. And after Napoleon's defeat, we have this period called the Restoration Period. Um, and it's a period where the political balance is restored. That these governments that had been taken over by Napoleon that had had their kings and queens deposed, removed, and replaced by Napoleon's um, siblings and relations. Um, after Napoleon loses, now people are like, all right, what do we do with this government? What do we do with this country? Who's gonna rule? So they wanna restore the monarchies. Um, this is also known as an era of diplomacy. The Napoleonic War is terrible. It ruins the lives of hundreds of thousands of people are um, you know, directly affected by these conflicts, by this war that lasts for more than a decade. Um, and in addition, millions of lives are upended. So afterwards, people were like, across Europe, they're like, we don't wanna fight anymore. It's not a good look. Let's stop fighting. Instead, let's have this era of diplomacy. And what does that mean? It means that countries are governing by accord, by discussions, instead of wars and conflicts. Prior to this period, um, it was pretty common for countries to be um, at war with each other and within themselves. Um, you know, it was a really pretty much like a consistent experience that there was always conflicts happening throughout Europe. Um, some wars lasting, you know, for like a couple of months, a couple of years. Um, some wars lasted decades, like the Thirty Years' War. Some wars lasted more than a century, like the Hundred Years' War. It was a lot of war. And in the 19th century, people thought, let's try something different. Let's try diplomacy. Um, and instead, you know, like have conversations and debate and discussions. What we're familiar with now, um, that we're very fortunate, we live in an era of diplomacy when our country has a conflict with another country, as opposed to straight up declaring war on them. Although sometimes our president likes to say that he's going to do that. Um, instead, they negotiate and they discuss um, and they want to avoid conflict because war is terrible. We always want to avoid that. This era of diplomacy is going to create a balance of power in Europe. That should be an in Europe, not power in Europe. I'm not trying to be really cool there. That's just a typo. Um, so what does this mean? It means that England, the United Kingdom, um, France, Austria, Russia, which will become Germany, more on that later, and Russia are all relatively equal in size and power which means that they're balanced, um, which leads to this era of peace. Because they're all kind of the same size, because they're all balanced, no one has an advantage one over the other, um, it creates this era of peace where there are no wars between these states of Europe for at least a little bit of time, you know, it's all with 30 plus years there or so. Um, because it's not to anyone's advantage, right? They're all equally matched and no one has a leg up, no one has an advantage, so it helps maintain the peace. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, what does this look like? Lucky for you, I have a map. Woo! All right, so here's a map of Europe um, in 1815 or so. So just to get a sense, so, you know, Napoleon came with France, and during the Napoleonic Wars, he took over Spain and Portugal, took over a good chunk of Italy, well, become Italy, took over a good chunk of Austrian Empire, Prussia. He was all up in Europe, right? So after um, he's deposed, after he's removed and um, exiled, um, all these countries have to like restore themselves. And this balance of power what I'm talking about, so we have Great Britain here, which I don't know why they're hidden, they're super powerful. Um, France, Austria, 
Prussia is one of the many German confederation. Um, the German confederation is the confederation of German states that had been um, around since the Middle Ages or so. Prussia is one of the largest ones. Um, Bavaria is another one. Um, and they're really kind of dominating. And then there's a whole bunch of other smaller ones, as we'll see. And then um, the final balance is Russia. Despite Russia being way, obviously, much larger, um, their power is still relative because a lot of this land is just farmland. And you know, they still don't have a lot of power. They're kind of behind the rest of Europe in industrializing, et cetera. All right, so that's Europe in 1815. Um, what else is happening? So we're restoring this political balance, which means that kings and monarchies are put back in control of the governments. Um, who is supporting this? A group of people called conservatives. They're also oftentimes called reactionaries. This means that they are reacting to the change and they want to conserve. They want to go back to how things were. Um, and we're familiar with the term conservatives. When we think about our political landscape, conservatives and liberals, conservatives often being Republicans, liberals often being Democrats. And the concept still um, is um, somewhat legitimate that conservatives, even in our current era, they typically do not support change. They wanna conserve, they wanna maintain the status quo. They wanna keep things as they were. So in the restoration period, these conservatives, they wanted to go back to the monarchies go back to the pre-revolutionary time. Some of them really wanted to go back to the Ancham regime um, and maintain that general status quo. Their goal is to reverse the political and social changes. So a lot of that liberty, a lot of those freedoms, a lot of those political social changes that came about from the French Revolution and other Atlantic revolutions, they were like, oh, let's get rid of that. We're not, we're not down for that. Let's go back to what used to work for us, which are kingdoms, monarchies, very few people have control and power, and, um, and that's just the way they like it. And they're going to be more successful in Eastern Europe, Central Europe, and Southern Europe. So we're going to see, um, as the 19th century progresses, we're going to see Eastern, Central, and Southern Europe, they're going to continue to maintain their kingdoms and monarchies much more so than other regions of the continent. All right, now, as you can imagine, some people are like, um, we liked those changes. We enjoyed the French Revolution, minus the whole reign of terror. And um, we think that there should continue to be change. So there are a lot of challenges to this period, to the restoration period. Um, two main groups who challenge them are the radicals and then the liberals. And as you can imply, they're probably connected. So radicals or radicalism um, thought that the revolutions were not enough and they wanted even more change. So they're radical. They're like, they wanted to go beyond. They're like, you know what? The French Revolution was awesome, but let's do more. As you can imagine, they're in the minority, um, but they're going to pop up often throughout the 19th into the 20th and frankly into the 21st century. We still have a lot of radicals um, despite their minority grouping. The larger group that is really opposing restoration are the liberals or liberalism. And just like we're familiar with conservatives in our political environment, liberals the same. Um, they want to continue changes from the revolutions because they fear strong governments. They are part of the masses of people that did not have rights under the Anshan regime, that did not have freedoms, did not have liberty under these monarchies and governments, and they feared going back. Um, they feared these governments actually going even further as some reactionaries and conservatives wanted. Um, they feared that governments could become tyrannies in which people had no freedoms under um, you know, heads of state that are total autocrats and total um, you know, almost dictators. Um, same thing in our um, world today that our liberal part political party and the Democrats typically want to continue to build on changes. They don't want to maintain the status quo they want to change things. Um, so we can still see some of those connections. Now in Europe at this time, the liberals are also promoting the rights of individuals. So really inspired by things like the Declaration of um, Rights of Man, really inspired by what happened um, in Latin America and in Haiti, et cetera. Um, and they're also not really feeling the church. Um, we haven't talked about the church too much. Um, you know, Europe is primarily a Catholic Christian um, continent, um, and the church throughout, um, you know, the previous millennia or so has 
um, historically had a lot of power. At times, there have been abuses of those power. If you remember learning about things like um, Martin Luther and the Reformation, etc. So liberals um, are also wanting to move away from church having power. Um, that first estate from um, France, they're not feeling that so much. And they really want to instead put power in the rights of individuals and to people. And what we're going to see is they are going to find a lot more success in England, um, France, and in Northern Europe. So we're going to see um, a lot more success um, in those regions. So what we're seeing is kind of a split. Northern Europe is going to become more liberal um, in the sense that they're promoting more change and allowing um, less control of monarchies, et cetera, whereas Southern and Central and Eastern Europe, they're going to kind of go more conservative and maintain um, the power of the monarchies. All right, one final thing to note. Is this a new thing? Yes. All right. Um, now we're moving into nationalism, this real concept of that pride in one's culture, one's heritage, etc. cetera. Um, what does that really look like in Europe in the 19th century? Well, the first thing to note is that nationalism is inspired by the French Revolution, that belief in popular sovereignty, which is just a fancy word, a fancy phrase um, defining the principle based on the role of the people in the government. And if you remember going all the way back to that ancient history, when you learned about ancient Greece and Rome, um, they had similar beliefs in their governments. Um, and it really is the foundation of democracy. Democracy literally means demos is people, krasi is government. So it's government by the people. Another way of looking at that is popular sovereignty, popular the masses, what's popular, there's lots of people, and sovereignty is one's ability to rule. So the masses are ruling, the people are ruling. We live in a land of popular sovereignty. Right now, we have elected officials, and if we don't like our officials, we vote for other people. That's popular sovereignty in a nutshell. Um, our government cannot just do whatever they want. They're uh, beholden to the people, and the people in the country um, get to tell their leaders what to do. Um, in this concept, we're thinking about people in the 19th century. People are all those who share common language, history, customs, and culture. So people are really being inspired by that concept of nations and nationalism. And the French Revolution is really going to be the foundation of these nationalist movements, which have a goal to create new countries based on common shared traits. So you know, as I mentioned before, prior to the 19th century, people were in countries, they were in states, um, without really thinking about why they were in those states. They were just there. Um, a lot of people believed it was what um, their God wanted um, to be, that divine rule, etc. But after the French Revolution, people are going to start questioning and say, like, well, why am I part of this country? And if, you know, if I'm not feeling like I should be part of this country, is there some other country that would make more sense for me to join? And that's really going to be at the base of a lot of our nationalist movements, creating these new countries. And in the later 19th century, we are going to see several new countries created. Two of the biggest countries that are created are going to be Italy and Germany that um, start unifying um, in the 1860s. So prior to um, 18, by 1871, prior to this time, both Italy and Germany did not exist. Instead, there were small states, there were small kingdoms within the region of what will become Italy and the region of what will become Germany with different languages, values, etc. Now, don't freak out, but I'm going to go to the next slide real fast so we can kind of visually see this. So here we have what will become Germany, right? The Germany that we're familiar with, maybe some of us have been to, beautiful country, lots going on. Here's the country of Italy. There's that little boot, you know, that we've been to with Rome and Florence, et cetera, et cetera. Prior to 1871, Italy was a bunch of different kingdoms. So we have the kingdom of uh, Venetia, we have the kingdom of Lombardy, the kingdom of Sardinia, um, which was Piedmont Sardinia, we have the kingdom of Naples, et cetera. Um, we had the kingdom of Rome, we had the Tuscan um, city-states, um, Florence, et cetera. So these were all different, um, different little sovereign states that controlled themselves, that did not really interact um, and did not really like have any control. So what was going on in Venetia, um, the kingdom of Sardinia could not really say. 
Um, they did have a lot of shared common traits and common values, which is what will lead to their unification, but they were primarily unique and different. Same thing with Germany. Now, as I said prior, the German Confederation was a confederation of about 30 different German states. These were all people that shared Germanic um, culture and heritage, but were unto themselves unique. So Prussia is gonna be our largest one up here. Bavaria is another large one, but then there's all these other small ones. There's Silesia, there's, um, oh Lord, I'm gonna try to speak some German here. There's Schleswig and Holstein and Hanover and Westphalia and Brandenburg. Um, et cetera, et cetera, Saxony, blah, blah, blah. So they're all um, unique unto themselves. So now we're gonna visually remind that as we go back to the slide. So these small different states. Now there are people in both of these states that say, we could be more powerful if we unify together. Looking at that concert, that bounce of power in Europe, we could you know, be even more powerful than France and England if we unified. So these liberal nationalists, they use culture to convince people of their connections. So even though um, within um, what will become Italy and Germany, there's a lot of um, different values, et cetera, um, the nationalists are going to want to inspire people to join together. And they actually use a lot of culture in the sense of like, you know, music, poetry, um, <clears throat> plays, um, you know, newspapers, et cetera, to convince people to be like, hey, even though you Hanoverians, you're, you know, dressed differently and have different customs than the Prussians, you're more unite, you know, I love, you're more alike than you are different. You should join together. And they really convince. It's a, um, it's really a, um, you know, like multi-year process of trying to convince people throughout the region. Um, the other thing that they're going to use, the other tactic, is um, war and conflict to unite the peoples because they basically give the peoples a common enemy. So the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? So like, you know, I'm fighting so-and-so and you're fighting so-and-so. We should join together to fight so-and-so. And that's going to be relatively successful for Italy, but it's going to be super successful for Germany. And in fact, that's literally how Germany... Um, unifies is first they fight with um, a little bit in the east and then they fight with the Danes, they fight with Denmark and that's how they get some of their unification and then the really big one is they're going to fight with the French and um, that's really what's going to um, solidify the um, western half of um, Germany. So it really comes out of the Franco-Prussian War when the German Empire here is going to fight with the Republic of France um, and gain some land, um, specifically a little region called Alsace-Lorraine, which, spoiler alert, we're going to hear about for the rest of the semester, for the rest of 2020, Alsace and Lorraine is just going to keep popping up its little head. So spoiler alert on that. All right, let's talk a little bit more about the unification. So Italy is going to be unified by men named Camillo de Cavour um, under King Vittorio Emmanuel. He's going to be the first king of Italy. He had been the king of um, Piedmont and Sardinia, and then he becomes king of all of Italy. It's very exciting. If you ever go to Italy, every single city you go to, you're going to see a Via Cavour, which is Cavour Street. You're going to see Via uh, Vittorio Emmanuel. It's all over the place. Camillo de Cavour and Vittorio Emanuel are basically like the George Washingtons of Italy. It's a big deal. People are really excited about them. Same thing's going to happen in Germany, except now we're going to have some German guys. So um, the chancellor, I'm sorry, the um, Mr. Um, Otto von Bismarck, he is really going to be the architect of uniting Germany. He is just having wars left and right. He is really um, just defining all that. And he's going to help Germany um, unify under Kaiser Wilhelm I. Kaiser is just a German word for Caesar, which is just a German word for emperor. So basically they're like, you know, the Germans are really excited about thinking back to their like long standing heritage of being part of the Holy Roman Empire. And they really want to celebrate that because another part of this is that extreme nationalism, so much pride in their nation. They're really, really feeling themselves at this time. 
Um, both monarchies still have super diverse populations that have all these different cultures, et cetera. Um, and there are some liberal elements, like there is some like voting, there is some constitutional monarchies. Um, so they're not like hardcore autocrats and not hardcore tyrannies of government, but overall they're still relatively conservative because they are still monarchies and the majority of people still have very little to no freedoms. Um, the other thing to note, and this is again spoiler for the future, is that Germany is uh, not going to be content with just unifying and thinking like, yay, we're Germany now. Um, they're going to be like, yay, we're Germany, and we were really successful by fighting wars, so we should make sure that we are always successful fighting wars, and let's keep building our army. And that little industrial revolution that they saw happening in England, <clears throat> um, Germany is going to say, hey, that sounds great. We have iron. We have uh, copper and other materials. Let's industrialize ourselves. And actually, they are going to, in the late 19th century, become the most industrialized nation in um, Europe and really, really just start dominating things. So um, Germany is really setting themselves up to really dominate the 20th century, which um, they do because, as we've seen, um, you know, thinking about what happened in the 20th century and how Germany is always in the midst of it. It starts here with German unification in the 19th century. Also that bad blood between Germany and France, this is where it comes from, from their unification, because the Germans are uh, not super kind about their actions. Story for another day. All right, um, lest you think it's only happening in um, Germany and Italy, there's a lot of nationalism happening elsewhere as well. Um, and in fact, I'm going to skip ahead and just show you the map so we can get a sense. So all these little areas where we see, um, you know, little, um, I don't even know what I call these, little red blow up things, um, we're going to see nationalist movements. So it is happening up in the um, west, it is happening in the east, it's happening in the south, it's happening in the north, it's all over. All right, so what does this mean? Um, other nationalist movements, the Greeks and the Serbs are going to assert their independence from the Ottoman Empire. I'm going to make you all crazy and flip back and forth. So remember the Ottoman Empire that had been, um, you know, part of the Middle East and at one point had really gotten up in Eastern Asia. The Greeks had been part of the Ottoman Empire for a while and they actually are going to gain independence in the 19th century and bounce out. They're feeling pretty good about themselves. Um, and then the Serbs up here, which is on part of the, um, northwestern part of the empire, they're also going to um, achieve independence. So they're one of our first movements in southeastern Europe. So they assert their independence from the Ottoman Empire. Our next group that are going to um, try to assert independence, they're not going to be nearly as successful, are going to be the Czechs and the Hungarians. And they're going to demand more independence within the Austrian Empire, but spoiler alert, they're not going to be very successful. So to look at what we're talking about, here's the Austrian Empire. So the Czechs, this area right here will become Czechoslovakia. Um, this area right here will be Hungary. So these people in the western part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, they are tired of it. They want to bounce out. Why do they want to bounce out? Because the Czechs say, we have our own identity. We speak Czech. We practice our Czech customs. We do all these things. We are not Austrian. So why are we part of the Austrian Empire? That's not cool. Um, in the Russian Empire, the Poles and the Ukrainians, they're not feeling so hot because um, what's going on in the Russian Empire is at this time in the 19th century, Russia is just going to really start to turn to autocracy, really start to turn to like hardcore czarist rule. They're going to like really try to consolidate all their power and uh, try to, you know, get rid of anyone who opposes them. Um, and also, if you are practicing your own identity, your own culture, that's a no-go. And in fact, it's going to become low-key illegal. Um, so the Poles and Ukrainians, um, they're not feeling their lives in the Russian Empire either. So where we talk about this area right here, which will become Poland and the Ukrainians down here, um, they're saying to themselves, hey, we have our own culture, our own identity. Why are we part of the Russian Empire? Um, we don't like it. And uh, on top of that, y'all are kind of like being really mean to us. So we want to bounce out. They're not going to be successful because Russia is uh, not kind of that. Um, the Irish, they are part of Great Britain, had been part of Great Britain since the unification of 1707. And the Irish are um, really hardcore views by the British. 
Um, you know, like they're really looked down upon. They're called the bog people. They have no rights. Um, they're not allowed to practice Catholicism. England is an Anglican. It's a um, Protestant nation. And the Irish are really just pissed off about it and really not loving their life. Um, and they are going to start seeking separation from Great Britain and really start this period of wanting to um, rebel um, and break away. They're not going to be successful until um, the 20th century. On top of that, the Irish are also dealing with things like the famine, which the British did not help them and were totally fine to allow like millions of Irish to start to that super brutal um, part of that Irish potato famine. So they really hate the British. And then finally, our last group to start talking about, and this is a group that we're going to hear about time and time again, are Jews in Europe. Now, Jews um, are a nation of peoples without a state. Um, prior to or um, after um, biblical times, millions of Jews settle in Eastern Europe, but they never establish and create their own state. Instead, they're the minorities um, throughout Europe. And in the 19th century, especially in the later 19th century, they're going to realize that uh, it's not so good for them to be in Europe because there's a thing called anti-Semitism, which is hatred of Jews. Um, and they're really being persecuted. And a bunch of Jews say, you know, we should go back to our homeland, back to our biblical land, um, which is the region of Palestine. But again, that's a story for another day. So to kind of um, review here, we have nationalist movements all over. So Ireland's wanting to break away from the British. We have um, the Poles and the Ukrainians trying to break away from the Russians. We have the Serbs and the Greeks who are actually successful breaking away. We have the Czechs um, and the Hungarians trying to break away from Austria. We have some other movements where people on the low countries here are trying to break away from um, various empires. And then we also have our unification of Germany and Italy. And that's really what's going on with nationalism in Europe. But wait, there's more. We're in the home stretch, however, I promise. Lest you think that nationalism is solely happening only in Europe and nowhere else, um, I would love to um, bring your attention to the fact that there's nation building happening in the Americas as well. Um, the reason why we don't talk about nation building outside of the Americas and Europe is because, as we'll see, what happens for Africa and Asia and some parts of the Middle East, um, instead of really being um, a period of nationalism, instead for these regions, it's going to be a period of colonization, which we'll talk about um, starting next week. All right, so briefly, what's happening in the Americas, um, going from North America to South so in uh, North America, the United States is expanding west across indigenous native lands. They're influenced by this idea of manifest destiny, which you might remember from um, eighth grade history. But basically, it's this belief that, like, you know, God wants the white people to take over the land. And if God didn't want the white people to take over the land, God wouldn't have made the white people so powerful and strong. Um, it's pretty messed up. It's super racist. It um, basically, like, destroys the lives of millions of indigenous peoples. It sets up the reservation system that we are still looking at today, and it is directly responsible for why Native Americans are still um, facing so much, um, so much persecution and still um, an oppression to this day. Um, so that's what's going on in the United States, but they are super nationalistic about it. In the United States, they are really developing this national identity of what it means to be an American. You can't see me, but I'm using finger quotes for that. Um, our neighbors to the north, they're also experiencing some nationalism. They gained independence from um, the British, so they were also a former colony. But unlike uh, this country, the Canadians do it much more peacefully, and it takes them another hundred years. Um, so they gained independence in 1866. It's pretty exciting for them. Um, they're still part of the Commonwealth, that's story for another day. But one of the first things that they have to deal with is this fear of their neighbors to the south because they worry that um, if they don't like establish themselves, these Canadians, um, and give themselves their own sovereignty and their own statehood, that the Americans to the South might want to invade and absorb them. And you know, then we would just have you know, United States of America going from the border of Mexico all the way up to the Arctic, and that would not be a cute book for the Canadians. So they say, we have to unify. Um, so we need to unite our distinct and diverse territories. Canada um, had been previously originally a French um, 
part of it was a French colony and then a large part of it was an English colony, um, which is why in Canada they're uh, dual nation land. Um, they have two national languages, French and English. Um, the French um, colonies of like Quebec and Montreal um, and to the east. And then the English speaking is all to the west, like Vancouver and Alberta and Edmonton. I'm just trying to name random things I can think of in Canada. Um, they're super diverse and super distinct. And at one point they thought they'd be their own like unique countries, but they're scared of America. So they say, all right, we'll band together. We'll reinforce our connectedness um, and, you know, band together so that way we can stand up against a potential feared American invasion. Um, it's also important to note that uh, unless you think that only um, this country is expanding and destroying the lands of the indigenous peoples, the Canadians did it as well but way less brutally, um, which is why they have a much better relationship with their First Nations peoples, which are um, what we call the Indigenous peoples in Canada, um, and why the First Nations um, are largely doing a lot better, and there's a lot more respect and a lot more um, privilege um, than our Indigenous peoples. All right, south of us, um, Latin America, as we know, um, Latin America has gained independence um, in the early 19th century, and nationalism and nation building um, is inspiring what's going on there as well. Um, so they share a common social history um, from long-term colonialism. Majority of Latin America, with the exception of a few countries here and there, Haiti, uh, Martinique, Brazil, etc., have largely been colonies of Spain. And for centuries, um, that social hierarchy, the peninsulars, the Creoles, and the Stizos, um, et cetera, et cetera, um, had really established a lot of um, social history and social shared culture. Um, so after independence, they continue to build on that shared culture. Um, and it's important to note that this um, nation building is really influenced by the minority elites who are controlling the wealth from farming natural resources, um, a lot of food production and a lot of natural minerals. Um, are still controlled by this minority elite that had been set up during the colonial period, which meant that the majority of the peoples in um, Latin America continue to um, have very little um, power. And these are gonna be our indigenous peoples, um, black and poor, they're left out. And that was our penultimate slide, which means for our final slide, congratulations, you did it, We're in the, we are here. Uh, by the later 19th century, by the later 1800s, we have a lot of new countries that have been established that have been unified by shared common values. Despite that, they still are um, relatively conservative and they still are diverse and that there's still a lot of different peoples, but they have these base common values. So new countries like Germany and Italy and what will later become um, in Serbia and Greece um, and what will become later other countries as well, um, they're being established. Other countries are continuing to consolidate their power and they're now being influenced by um, this belief of nationalism. They're using that pride in their culture and in their heritage to consolidate their power and um, become even stronger as countries. Um, and they're mostly continuing to um, continue these conservative social orders in which you have a minority elite often ruled by a king or queen or monarchy or at least a small group of powerful people. Um, and the majority are really left out, um, which will set things up for the 20th century. And as I mentioned, you know, we're talking about nationalism, primarily a Western concept that is primarily happening in Europe and the Americas, because what's going on in Africa and Asia is at the same time, um, one of the things that's making European countries feel really proud of themselves is that they are colonizing Africa and Asia. But there are people in those colonies that are also learning about nationalism and also becoming inspired, which will really set up the 20th century. So that is the cliffhanger that I will leave you with today. What's gonna happen? Only time will tell. Um, I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Thank you for bearing with it. Let me know if you have questions. Uh, leave questions in the comments, like and subscribe and have a great rest of your day and I will see you in class soon to uh, talk about this a little bit more and really pick up colonialism. So have a great night. Bye.